Welcome back to Steve and Friends. This week we have a special guest, George Gantz. George is a writer, philosopher, focusing on science, faith, philosophy, and society. How's he going to join in with the crew of Steve Keen and Friends? Find out next. Enjoy the show. So I have to, I have to just alert everybody. We have reached over 30 likes on YouTube, so I will be wearing a suit next week. Gee, I don't see Daniel wearing a suit. Steve wouldn't wear a suit. I'm the only one wearing a dunce cap right now. Uh, Marie? I think I gained some weight. Ah, oh, jeez. Ah. Oh. Welcome back to Steve and Friends on Ty Keens. As you can see, I am wearing a suit this week. I found one that fits, um, something that I wore this past summer at a wedding. Now, the one I was trying on there was the one I really wanted to wear. It was silky, shiny, um, but I noticed it didn't quite fit. Um, it's March 18th, 2023. We have a special guest, George Gantz, today. Um, George is actually a friend of Daniel's. Uh, but he has met Steve before. So there was a previous iteration of this show called COVID and Climate Correlations. And I'd like to do an, an impression that um, Daniel Daniel used to do an intro for the show. And it went something like this. Welcome to COVID and Climate Correlations. I'm Daniel Sanderson with Post. Keynesian economist Steve Keen. And I got hooked. I got hooked to the show as soon as I saw that. Um, so that's that's important. Everybody, chat. Let's let's keep doing this on the side. Hit the like button. Subscribe if you're watching on Twitter. Um, retweet, retweet it, sorry, and like it there. Then come over here and chat. Uh, I want to bring on Dan first. That seems to be my habit um, because, you know, Dan and I have really, you know, over the last six months put this show together. So let's let's shine some light on the man, Dan. Oh, oh geez. You know, I, I I just I'm listening to you do the COVID and climate correlation, and I'm thinking there's gonna be a point where you're actually better than me at that. And and we might have to pay royalty rights to tie Iron <laughs> Kings. <laughs> right? You know? Daniel? Tell yeah. me about tell me about your week. Oh goodness! I mean, uh, um, I've been busy, busy man, writing, exploring all the I, and AI. AI is just exploding everywhere. There was a recent release of Chat GPT, and uh, I, I, it seems like there's people. There's a battle going on with um, is is AI good? Is it bad? Or is it taking over the world? And I, I kind of just I don't know. It's uh, I kind of like it. I kind of, I think it's good. I think we could be using it to be more productive. So that's kind of where my mindset has been this week. Yeah. I see. Well, you know what? So I've been keeping track of your responses over the last few Saturdays, three to be exact. The first one was terrible. Um, you gave <laughs> nothing. Last week was more uplifting and this week is a little more technical. Okay. So um, thank you. 
I appreciate that. We're going to bring on... So I made a decision. I had an interview with a new contributor this past uh, week, um, and I've decided he is now going to be a permanent part of the show. He is going to be able to fill in for Steve if Steve is unavailable. Um, he has the qualifications that are on par with Steve, in my opinion, and I think Steve would agree. And we're going to bring him on. He was the guest from last week. Here's Mike. Mike. Hi, everyone. How you doing, buddy? Doing well. Glad to it's, be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, well, it's actually shocking you came back because I know how I am. <laughs> I wanted to see the suit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we better bring in the star of the show. That would be Professor Steve Keen. Steve? My whole role here, my whole role here is to, to balance the tutorial satorial elegance of tie with the sloppiness of a white t-shirt that I've just been wearing at the gym before I came here and interrupted my interrupted my workout to come and join in so perfect how was your how was your week okay. oh very busy working on the climate change stuff as always with uh with carbon tracker uh attended a, a festival for Alan Kerman who is one of wonderful non-orthodox economist a specialist in multi-agent modeling of uh of market dynamics and uh he he uh he wrote the, uh, a very important paper, uh, which has the subtitle of The Emperor Has No Clothes, mm. talking about the failure of neoclassical aggregation to work through the Sonnenschein Mantle de Broer theorem, Katrick. And the, uh, the Bank of England and uh, National Institute for Economic and Social Research put on a fish trip for Alan. So I, I couldn't make the Thursday, but I made the Friday, and it was wonderful. He's a great, great man. Nice. <laughs> hey, the ghost is right over here as well. I'm I'm actually probably halfway up the Australian sartorial standard. <laughs> At least I'm not wearing thongs, which is that one of those words that I know causes great hilarity when an Australian says, "Where's my thong?" in a public place in Australia, which is balanced, I must say, by an American friend of mine who uh, walked into a gym with 500 people and started doing an exercise class. Very spunky woman, American. And she said, hey, has anybody seen my fanny bag? Mike, we've got some help. Fanny, by the way, in Australian is slang for the front half of the backside, not the back half of the backside. <laughs> Five hundred people it just took a minute to get that image. Thanks, Steve, on a Saturday morning. 500, <laughs> 500 people doing an exercise class collapsed in laughter on the floor. Oh, Our, man. All right. I think it's, um, with all that said, thank you, Steve. Um, I think it's time to bring on our guest, George Gann. George. Hey, George. I'm here. <laughs> I'm not doing, sure. Man? I'm here. How you, how you doing, buddy? Uh, I'm doing great. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. It's actually my first appearance on a live stream. Uh, so very different than, uh, you know, the kind of being something where you can cut and paste later. You just got to be with it, but um, you know, I have uh, given presentations at live events, so you know, kind of used to that feel. But um, but I have to admit, you you guys all look very small on my screen. So it's like uh, um, not like we're sitting at a bar somewhere and you know toasting each other. But I'm we're, glad to be here. That, hmm. We're gonna fix that up in a second. Um, we're gonna. I'm going to take myself off, but you know, I, I really like to start the show on establishing what the connections are. In this case, it's going to be a connection between um, George and Daniel. So I'd like to ask George, we'll start this off. How did you meet Daniel? And if you can roll back uh, time a bit and give the audience an idea of how that um, worked out. Yeah, that's a good question. So um I've been uh, doing a post-retirement um, set of works, uh, reading, writing, analysis on a variety of things, big questions, complexity theory. And uh, I bumped into the PlankSip website and I said, oh, this guy's kind of interesting. I wanna, I wanna talk to him. Um, and I uh, reached out, Daniel and I had a first conversation and just really hit it off. Uh, I think uh, his, approach to philosophy is really, really comfortable and insightful. And uh, it tied in really nicely with some of the things that I've been working on. So we, we kind of established that friendship there. And we, we did a couple of things together. The big one was a, um, a, a series that we did on um, 
consilience, consciousness and consilience, looking at uh, E.O. Wilson's uh, book from the, uh, from the 90s on consilience and how, how can we bridge the divide between different disciplines in science or different, different disciplines in terms of philosophy and how do we bridge that gap and try and bring things together? It was a fascinating series, learned a lot. And so Daniel and I have been friends ever since and just, you know, touching base from time to time on what he's doing, what I'm doing. And, and uh, so that led to the invitation to come on the show. And I'm delighted to be here. Daniel, um, I want you to mirror what George just said. And from your perspective, you tell me how that relationship begins. Yeah, George is a sweetheart of a of a human being. I think he's uh, he's got a, a big heart, and I think there's an aspect of what George is doing that uh, is 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 legacy based, and um, I think that can resonate with Steve as well. I think uh, and the show. I think um, uh, we're 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 approaching that concept of legacy and uh, mixing in that with with friendship. And uh, I would say the only thing wrong with friendship is that there's just not enough of it. And uh, I think we should all focus on, on building more friends. And, you know, from a philosophical standpoint, what is, what does friendship mean? Right. And uh, there's a, um, there's a, a deep history. There's a, a, uh, a, a deep understanding of what friendship is and it's, it's effectively and emotionally it's trying to do something for somebody else uh ahead of yourself in a very simple sort of way right like how would i do something for george that would benefit george and i have the idea and it's not a unique or novel idea this is part of a, a lineage theory, a cultural lineage theory that is simply is how we're defined as a, a eusocial species. This is kind of a superpower uh, that we have uh, as a species is to uh, communicate in, in, in abstract thought and friendship is just one of those abstract manifestations. And I'm, I'm glad to have uh, George's friend and other people in the studio. So very grateful. That's so mushy. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 I'm now that we got that out of the way. I think <clears throat> I, I want to kind of touch on something that's been all over tw Twitter and the media. Well, there's actually a few things that happened this week, and I want to get uh, George's opinion. I know he's not exactly a banker, but I think his opinion might be insightful. I'd like to get Steve and Mike's as well. And that's the regional bank issue in the United States, and it's spreading potentially. We, we don't know this for sure or not, but it's it's something I want to I want to hear from everybody about. So I'm going to bring on Steve first, and he's done um, a blog post, and I'll find the link and I'll post it in the chat here in a moment. But I want to kind of I want to hear from him what he. He gathers about the whole situation. Is this a solvency issue, a liquidity issue? Um, is it systemic? <clears throat> what are the policy changes that need, yeah. to, need to change? What do you think, Steve? Well, it's fundamentally systemic. I mean, I've had a lot of uh, very uh, scatological details about uh, uh, Silicon Valley Bank and so on, how they weren't, uh, how they lobbied to have the, the, uh, $250 billion ceiling put in so they weren't covered by a lot of the regulate regulations. Uh, they didn't do the uh, hedging, et cetera, et cetera, the other banks do, blah, 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 blah. But the fundamental cause of this is the increase in interest rates uh, when you hold a large number of long-term government bonds. And this is something which is a systemic effect of raising bonds. Now, I posted something earlier about how I expected the... Uh, the government to be a force, the Fed to be forced to reverse direction because they've caused a recession by raising the rates up. Now, I was looking, what I was looking at primarily is credit based demand. And if credit based demand falls, then economic activity goes down with it. And I thought it would hit the asset markets first. What I did not cover, and I should have done this, so my bad, is that as interest rates rise, the value of government bonds falls. And when you have banks which are required to have bonds 
or reserves and very few other forms of assets are allowed on their balance sheet, it means their assets drop in value uh, while the liabilities remain the same. Now, that goes far enough, you're bankrupt. So there's a systemic challenge to banks for raising interest rates from the incredibly low levels they are right now. It didn't matter as much back in the uh, in the Vokler days because you know rates went from say eight percent to seventeen percent, uh, uh, which is a doubling pretty much. Uh, whereas what they've done, they've gone from one quarter or one half a percent to five percent. And when the, the longer term you bond, the more that hits the value of the bonds. So what I did in that post to do extremely simple, very very stylized Minsky model where I took roughly the numbers that apply for the American financial system and then it pretended that all bonds are what they call consoles. And the long consoles are infinitely dated bonds. And therefore, there's a perfectly inverse relationship between the, the uh, sale value of the, of the bonds and the interest rate. So as you put the interest rate up, the value of the bonds goes down. And I, did, I did a simple, I mean, it was too extreme if I chose the, the current interest rate numbers. So I chose to jump from 3% to 5%. And that uh, little symbolic exercise wiped out the equity of the banking sector, period. Now, that's the systemic factor. SVB was particularly exposed to that because it had a large number of long-dated bonds on its books. Now, strictly speaking, if, you, if your assets as a bank are fundamentally long-dated bonds, more so than they actually had loans, in fact, you're quite conservative, inverted commas. It shouldn't, it, it, the, the, the Federal Reserve should have realised, because they've got the responsibility here, the systemic effect of raising rates the, and therefore damaging the balance books, balance sheets, of the banking sector, but they haven't done it. And we've walked into it again. It's yet another case where letting neoclassical economists run everything means economics goes from one crisis to another. Wow, that's uh, very insightful. Uh, Steve, I wanted to actually throw this back over to Mike. Um, and <clears throat> I mean, how would you how would you respond to that? Would you say that that, that you you echo Steve's um, analysis and summary? Uh, would you add anything to that? Uh, do you fundamentally see it as a systemic uh, issue as Steve has has described. Ah, you've now. <laughs> so, okay, okay, okay great. Uh, yeah, okay, 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 yes, I, I I agree with Steve. Uh, what what he said. I I also would add a, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, let's all remember that there's no one on the planet who has been following economics that didn't understand that we have an inflation issue and that the central banks of the world, including the Fed, is, are going to be raising interest rates. OK, who, who didn't know that? It wasn't like we woke up one morning and there was a sudden uh, interest rate increase and they've been t telling us they're going to do that. So nobody, nobody didn't know. And so I would think that uh, the uh, people who regulate the banks and they're supposed to be stress testing the banks would be aware of this and say, said, let's take a look at everybody's, um, you know, balance sheet and see what we got here. You know, what's, if we get a black swan event or, or this systemic rise in rate, you know, what's going to happen here? Are, do we have any value at risk? In a similar vein, inside the banks, you typically have, you know, a C-suite uh, person uh, in charge of looking at overall value at risk and saying, you know, I got to make sure we're hedged and we're adjusting things as conditions change. And a lot of people seem to be asleep at the wheel on this. And I think some of it has to do with what we call an economics moral hazard. When you're playing with somebody else's money, ah, I'm not real worried about it. If we're too big to fail, if I know we're gonna be bailed out or my depositors are, and I'm unlikely to go to jail or even lose my job, I'm not, as concerned as I would otherwise be. So I think it's probably a combination of all of these, these factors, some described by Steve and some of these other things. Right. That's, um, that's very good. I mean, uh, it, it's in, at some level, I think that, that uh, it brings up this idea of skin in the game and <laughs> in, in, in a privatization model, but I'm not going to go there. I actually want to go to George and uh, uh, George, what are, what are your thoughts on this? Um, well, actually, I will go there because uh, if, you, if you want to think about the systemic nature of this problem, it's, it's not just limited to banking. It's not just limited to the, to the technicalities of, uh, of the market and the financial markets. It really is uh, the disconnect between 
uh, responsibility and accountability because you have uh, you have managers that uh, that are uh, short term oriented and um, uh, make decisions uh, not just on the basis of the uh, of the facts and circumstances, but based upon what their what their desires are. And there's a there's a uh, you know one of the features of neoliberalism is that it it allows it, it elevates the self-interest above the common interest. And so it separates an individual from the, the risk. So the individuals that are making those decisions are really removed from the, from the fundamental impact of the, uh, the damages that can occur when a risk is realized. So, um, so it really boils down to uh, human, uh, the stories humans tell each other and the virtues or lack thereof that they carry with them in making decisions, and if you're if you're uh, inoculated from the worst effects of those decisions, and you are you are uh, steeped in this mythology about well, if I'm just if I just continue being my selfish self in the system, everything's going to work out because you know that's what neoliberalism says it's going to do. Steve, I mean, you know, is, yeah. it, is it a slippery slope to uh, libertarianism, or what, what? I mean, like, what what are we talking about here? No. Well, I'm going to come on Lana's question up a moment. Is should the rules be augmented to allow an easier shift from low to high interest rate bonds? That actually isolates where this problem has come from. And we're seeing it isn't just SVB. It's the range of banks, including <coughs> oh, what's the, the Swiss bank has now got caught up in the whole thing as well. Um, so rising rates are reducing the value of the bonds that, that uh, banks hold. So the question is, why do they hold the bonds? And the answer is that rules, to, first of all, one set of rules tells, uh, made by parliaments, not, it's a law of parliament, not a law of physics, okay? Uh, and to quote Tesla on that, which I love, uh, and, and, and the SpaceX crowd, uh, there are laws of physics, everything else is a recommendation. Well, the recommendation made by the legislature was that the, uh, the central bank cannot buy bonds directly off the treasury. And another recommendation made is that the central banks, the, the treasury's account of the central bank cannot go negative. Now, those two rules mean that, first of all, the Treasury can't sell bonds to cover the deficit and not fund the deficit, but cover it. They can't sell bonds uh, to the central bank. They've got to sell it to the private banks. And then the private, the central bank, if it wants to buy bonds, have to buy them off the private banks. And the private banks can also sell those bonds to non-banks. The, the, the huge bond market has come out of that. Now, one defence for banks having bonds is that they get paid interest rates interest on the bonds, and that partially covers the cost of them running a payment system, which, of course, capitalism, everybody relies upon it. Uh, but if we got rid of those rules, we could first of all have the uh, central bank buying the bonds directly off the treasury, so the bonds would accumulate at the central bank. And secondly, and therefore there'd be no uh, risk of bond, bond changing would change the assets of the central bank, it wouldn't change the assets of the private bank. Uh, so the interest rate channel would be purer. And secondly, the central bank could pay interest on reserves, which they're doing already anyway, and use that as their control mechanism, not changing the value of bonds. So there's a way to get out of this, but it, guess what? To get rid of it, we've got to get rid of the neoliberals and neoclassical economists in charge of the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So my next question is for Mike, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious, is, is there um, an American specific difference. I mean, th this sounds to me like fundamentals um, that that would be um, ubiquitous throughout the world, right? And I'm I'm wondering, is there is there something about it, the the American economic system that would 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 um, surface or you would describe as a little bit different uh, to, to the way Steve explained that? Hold on, Mike. We'll put yeah, uh, well, I think uh, generally speaking, central banks around the world more or less operate the same way. So I think the, the, the central bank in the U.S., kind of the Fed kind of does the same things that Steve is describing. I do think that um, the, part of the reason for these rules that, uh, or I guess there, Steve suggested there's a suggestion by parliament, the treasury can't sell bonds directly to the central bank so they go through the commercial banking system and what have you stem from what uh, john maynard keynes different pronunciation from keynes <laughs> from thai you know, the, uh, the father of macroeconomics um 
suggested as to why we even have macroeconomics, and it's the fallacy of composition. And it's uh, if you attribute what happens to you or to me as being the same thing that would happen to the system as a whole, then you're, it's a logical fallacy. If you save more, good for you. If I save more, good for me. If everybody saves more, ceteris paribus, uh, we plunge the economy into a recession. You don't get the same result. And so people, including politicians, and for all I know, central bankers, think about, uh, they, 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 they have the fallacy of composition. So they, they introduce all of these restrictions and then the, 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 the banks do workarounds because in their minds, they're thinking of you know the deficit or debt at their house or their company or their city, and not for a sovereign nation with a sovereign fiat currency at the macro level, which is is different. So you get some of these sort of arcane um, gymnastics that have to happen in order for the central bank to try and stabilize things, as as Steve described. There's ways to re-engineer re it, redesign it so it's simpler. But they, people have these mental models based on sort of a micro level. And uh, they, I think a lot of them have this fallacy, this logical fallacy that they just don't see. Interesting stuff. A lot of good um, opinions there. And it's, it's so hard with all our media sources to suss through things and get a, a good you know, stable answer on what's really happening in our economy and with situations that uh, we're currently seeing in the banking system. I kind of want to steer this conversation towards George. Now, George, um, you have a website, and I'll bring it up here, spiralinquiry.org. I want you to tell me a little bit about that, what your background is, and Let's give the audience an idea of who George really is. Boy, that's that's a that's a tough one, Todd. But let me let me start. Uh, I went to Stanford in 1969. I was in love with mathematics and science. I'd grown up in a scientifically literate household. My father was a PhD chemist. And I loved the idea that between science and mathematics, we were going to be able to figure it all out. And uh, so I got exposed in physics to, uh, you know, at that point, quantum physics was, you know, quite active and uh, standard particle was still in process, you know, very, very confusing. And then I, in, the, in the mathematics course that I was taking, I got introduced to um, Kurt Gödel's incompleteness theorems, which basically says in any sophisticated logical system, and we want to be rational now, we want to be logical, we want to be rational, but in any sophisticated logical system, there will be statements that are true statements that can't be proved. So there's unprovability and there's, and there's incompleteness. You can have consistency, but you can't have complete knowledge, even within a logical system, a mathematical system. So I, uh, I was very disillusioned from the big questions, and I decided I wasn't going to learn the meaning of life by going into philosophy. So I went off and, you know, got a job and got married and had kids and had a divorce and, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of iterations. I ended up doing a career uh, in a regulated monopoly, and that was very interesting education because, uh, among other things, now I have a perspective. I've been retired, retired for a little over 10 years uh, that I can see the, the human dynamics involved in corporate boardrooms where, you know, nobody wants to give the boss bad news. Uh, uh, and in a regulated monopoly, your, your, your customer is not the customer, it's the regulator. So it makes a lot of sense to hire legal talent and communication talent de dedicated to keeping the regulators happy. It matters less what you know, what the relationship is with the customer. Because even when you screw up, the regulators will take care of you and you'll get bailed out if you have good regulatory relations. So it gave me a picture of how humans behave in those kinds of situations. And, and then you layer over that, uh, as I was commenting earlier, you know, kind of the, the neoliberalism, which gives you the permission to be selfish and self-righteous at the same time, which is really a poisonous uh, combination for human beings. Um, anyway, I retired, was able to retire early. Uh, my, my kids, uh, by that time had grown up, uh, I was in a wonderful relationship with a fantastic woman. I still am. We have nine grandchildren and, 
in the past, uh, you know, since 2011 when I retired, uh, I've been looking at big questions again. Um, and my early uh, efforts were in terms of can we integrate science and spirituality in any kind of a meaningful way? And, I, and I'm not comfortable with Stephen Jay Gould's uh, representation that these are, uh, 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 what's the phrase, you know, different, different areas of interest, non-overlapping magisteria. Don't buy that. So I'm, I got interested in sort of the concepts of consilience and how the different, different sciences work together and how they might inform our spiritual life and vice versa. And that drew me into the field of complexity science, which is uh, a uh, collection of uh, uh, many, many different disciplines uh, looking at systems in different ways. And particularly the model is um, uh, dynamic, uh, complex dynamic systems, which um, uh, process information or process flow or process money. And in that uh, processing, uh, uh, new behaviors emerge. So it's the emergent phenomenon come out of those behaviors. And so I've been looking at that, at the, at that uh, pretty intensely. And uh, a year ago, I started, a, in addition to Spiral Inquiry, which is my a static blog of you know, writing and ideas, um, I started a podcast, again, this was partly inspired by Daniel, thank you, um, called Making Sense of Complexity. So I'm interviewing complexity science practitioners and philosophers, trying to get an understanding of how, how do we make sense of this you know, uncertain, uh, non-computable, unprovable, uh, these kinds of features of both math and science and physics. How do we make sense of it? Um, the old Newtonian view of the world as mechanistic and machine driven and logical and all of that stuff, it just doesn't work anymore in the, in the 21st century. So how, how do these people make sense of it and how can we make sense of these, uh, uh, of the way the world actually works as opposed to the way we want it to work? So that's a little background and, um, uh, uh, and I, I love this economics conversation because economics is a complex system of immense proportions built upon the interactions of some 8 billion uh, complex systems of themselves that are all built of, of cellular materials and organs that are all each of themselves complex systems. And so it goes on and on. And it's just uh, beautiful to see these things uh, looked at from, you know, from this perspective. So I'm happy to be here. I hope that helps, Ty. Yeah, that does. Um, I wanted to throw this out to either Mike or Steve. Um, and <clears throat> basically, I'd like you guys to geek out a little bit. And what I'm thinking of is the mathematics behind either agent-based models or um, uh, macroeconomic models. Uh, what's kind of under the hood? I mean, um, you guys are both working with software programs that are um, that embrace um, that embrace complexity. So what do you guys think? I'm going to throw that out to either one of you. Please geek out and uh, let's talk about some of the mathematics behind and, and under the hood. Mike, I'll, I'll take second rank here. You can dive into the first. I think we both dive in on this one. Sure. Um, well, if, if you want to do math, I do system dynamics, uh, computer simulation modeling. I do a little bit of agent-based modeling when, when not, not every problem is a system dynamics problem. So you got to be able to recognize when to pull the right tool out of the toolkit. But mainly I do system dynamics. If you want to do math talk, we simulate linear, but really mostly nonlinear ordinary differential equations. And uh, they have a lot of interesting uh, features. One of them is a shifting loop dominance. So we uh, examine these uh, nonlinear ordinary differential equations from a feedback or, or endogenous perspective. So when we build a model, we're always trying to say, you know, we're, we're, we're simplifying reality. We're not trying to make a digital twin of the world. So we got to leave stuff out. So the stuff we put in, uh, we want to be uh, part of closed feedback loops so that we're looking at sort of the design of the system, the feedback, uh, a, a, a nest of feedback loops that make up the design of the system. And the, the dominance of these loops can change over time, and it makes it very difficult to understand 
the behavior of a complex system when you have a feedback loop over here strong and over here weak. But as time unfolds, this one gets weaker and this one gets stronger and suddenly there's a, a shift in loop dominance. So why did something happen? Well, try and figure that out. It's really, uh, it's really difficult. Now, software is making it easier uh, to diagnose that sort of thing. So we, um, we can't solve these models analytically with all the stuff you learn in calculus class, integration by parts and by substitution, all that stuff. That's valuable. I'm not saying it's not. But to solve a dynamic system, what that means, whether you're doing a traditional uh, difference equation or differential equation, system dynamics model, agent-based model, what that means from a system dynamics perspective is finding out how much stuff is in each of a system stocks at every point in time. So we model not only with feedback loops, but with stocks and flows. Stocks are bathtubs. So how much is in each of my bathtubs at every point in time? And when you know that, either analytically or through simulation, you solved a, a, a dynamic system, right? So uh, there's all sorts of techniques, mathematical techniques for doing that. There's all sorts of software solutions now for investigating uh, feedback loop dominance. And I'll, I'll wind up with this. What we find is that um, uh, nonlinear dynamic feedback systems are very robust. The feedback loop design of the system, and it's not, you, it's usually not consciously designed that way. It's, it's evolved that way. Like, like the United States tax code, no one in their right mind would design it from scratch <laughs> the way it is now. The U.S. healthcare system no one would design it from scratch that way. It's gotten that way through, you know, an innumerable evolutionary steps, but it is what it is, right? And it's very hard to change because these feedback loops work to adapt and keep the system where it's at. You shove the system with a policy change and those loops work to keep it where it's at, right? So using the model to look for leverage points where you can intervene with a policy and get a change in behavior uh, a system redesign, redesigning the airplane, so to speak, is what we use a system dynamics model for. So I'll let me, I'll leave it. Yeah. There. Okay. Look, I'll, I'll start with an anecdote from uh, my days as an academic in a neoclassical economics department. And there's a, there's a lovely uh, uh, Girish Amalek, I mentioned him by name because he's a good bloke, uh, was an econometrician. And he had a student who was doing a uh, PhD. And it's typical at that time, we're doing what they call computable general equilibrium models. And most of the time, just like we do numerical simulation in system dynamics, most CGE models build a model and then a numerical simulation. But Giris thought he'd push the student a bit and he got him to set up a symbolic general equilibrium model. And he said, look, we're trying to solve this in Mathematica and we can't solve it. It won't give us a solution. What are we doing wrong? And I simply asked, how many, how many, uh, well, what size is your matrix? What's your input output matrix? He said, it's seven by seven. I said, right, come into my room. And I showed him a post on the wall from Mathematica explaining, I think it's Galois theory, set theory, that explained that there is no, the, a seven dimensional matrix uh, can be reduced to a seventh order uh, uh, polynomial equation. So A plus BX out to CX to the Sixth, I think, in that. I mean, it's maybe the sixth is the seventh. Uh, and there is no solution, period, for a fourth order or above, a fifth order or above, pardon me, uh, polynomial. Literally none. So everybody says, you know, you've got y equals ax plus b, a plus bx plus uh, a plus bx plus cx squared. What's the solution? We all rattle it off. A minus b plus a minus squared of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Yeah. You try to do it for the third, the cubic. It covers half a computer screen. You try to do it for a fourth, you get something which covers half your suburb. You try it for a fifth, there is no solution. Okay, so this is part of what George was talking about earlier: uh, that there are uh, there are mathematics has proven it has limits, and mathematicians respect those limits and know what you have to work within within it. Um, now that where the com com complexity comes in, when you're modeling a complex system, uh, you get uh, you get nothing interesting with a one-dimensional system. That's population growth or decline. You get something interesting with two interacting populations, predator prey type dynamics, and things like that. But there's only three possible outcomes. You model either cycles towards equilibrium, cycles away from equilibrium towards a, what's called a limit cycle, or it breaks down. It goes off the edge of the meaningful parameters of the system. 
so there's nothing interesting in that, really. The 13th order dimension stuff is where you get a, a crazy outcome because the dynamic process you can describe for a, a third order system is uh, like with, with, the, with the first order, with the second order system, uh, it's whatever you can draw on, a, on, on the surface of your table by moving your finger in such a way your path never intersects itself. Those, and that makes quite a limited set of dynamics you can join. When you go third dimensional, move your finger inside a box without intersecting your path. You can do virtually anything. The complexity comes out with a third dimension. And so uh, then what you find is if you have equilibria in the system, they may or may not be stable. They may or may not actually exist. So the whole world of thinking in equilibria gets thrown out the window. And you'll, you'll use equilibria when you want to do calculations about the stability properties of your model and characterize its dynamics around an equilibrium point. But you know it ain't going to be an equilibrium. Now, that's the complete opposite of all the garbage that neoclassical economists still spout out about equilibrium and how they can imagine, as, as Mike said earlier and George said, pardon me, too, the incredibly complex, 8 billion people, each of themselves are a nonlinear evolutionary function in this huge system. How on earth they can think equilibrium is where it exists shows how little they know about reality. Wow. Okay, well, I got to take that in. <clears throat> that was a lot, Steve. <laughs> That was a lot. I'm going to get George's opinion on on kind of this topic here in a second. But what I need to do is thank everybody for joining in today's show. We appreciate you. I personally love you guys. Um, I need to take some time to address the chatters from last week because I think it's important to give recognition to all the people that join us. So I've got our top 10 list again. I'm going to read these names the best I can. And pardon me if I make a mistake, but again, we have Ghost on the Half Shelf. Ghost, you're here every week. Um, sometimes I even battle you in the comments underneath the chat after the show, which is actually quite enjoyable to do. So thank you for always participating in every fashion of it. Lana Dell, um, I'm really happy I'm seeing you here every week. Uh, I know Steve loves you. I love you. Um, if Mike gets to know you, he'll love you. Same with Dan. He'll love you too. Um, B, we've got B27, Botched Mandela, Conrad Zubella, Joe Polito, Jennifer Relic. Uh, at number eight, we have TR. I wonder what TR stands for. Hmm. Too real. We'll call it too real. We've got Thomas Sun Sir Jed. Uh, that might be a real name or a pretend name. I'm not sure. And we have Tom S. And Tom S., I'm glad you joined in with us last week. Um, Tom S. uses um, Minsky, which is the software developed by Professor Steve Keen. I've seen quite a few of his models now, so it's uh, I'm really happy you, you, you came on to the show. That's um, exciting. Um, we're going to be here for another hour and 15 minutes. Uh, but I'm going to let George, uh, hopefully he hasn't lost his train of thought, but I want to get him in on the conversation about what Mike and Steve were just talking about. George? Sure. Thanks, Ty. Yeah. Um, Steve, that was the unprovability, undecidability in a concrete way. And there's another great example <clears throat> of the difficulty of mathematics in certain problems. And, um, mm. and this one comes from Newtonian mechanics. The uh, Newton's mm -hmm. laws of motions are perfect. They capture it. Mm -hmm. You understand how two bodies are interacting and uh, uh, it doesn't apply to all situations, but you know, you, you get that. And the math for two bodies interacting with each other is yeah. great and it's solvable and no problem. Put three bodies together, it becomes insoluble. You cannot, yep. there's no way to solve the question of what's happening in three, three bodies. So that is what's, referred to as a chaotic system. It just is not yeah. something that's amenable to the mathematics. And I also wanted to go back to the complex system dynamics that, uh, that both of you were talking about. Um, because uh, yes, as Mike said, in many, for example, biological systems that have come about through a complex process of evolution, these feedback loops will help keep the entity within a zone of homeostasis where it's, you know, it's safe, it's alive. Um, 
Uh, but uh, that doesn't, uh, that's not always the case for dynamic systems. And what the instability sometimes comes up with is either long tails, which um, people talk about, or uh, tipping points. And a tipping point would be where this system, you know, kind of reaches the edge of what it's able to do, but it's being pushed a little bit far. And then you reach that tipping point and it's over. And now you're into unknown territory with that, with that particular mm -hmm. dynamic system. So, so those are all issues that I know economists have to con confront because, yeah, there's robustness, and, but at a certain point. There is and they don't confront them, George. They, I mean, this is what I, it pisses me off about economics. They, uh, they've stuck with a 19th century mindset back at the sort of Plasian days when, you know, if I, if I know the, uh, give me, give me a, the equation of the, of the universe, and I can predict it not only forward but backward, and and that conceit is still live amongst economists because they don't learn complex systems, mm -hmm. they don't learn all this stuff, and in fact, when you, you learn it, it's antithetical to the way that they actually model. So, in in a sense, they're anti-evolutionary and anti-complexity. And, and this is what I find so frustrating dealing with them because they put it back into a framework which made plenty of sense in, in 1850. Okay? Mm -hmm. And they think they're being 21st century mathematicians mm -hmm. because, hey, it's complicated. Yeah. Well, so are Ptolemy's cycles. Mm -hmm. They completely misdescribe the universe. Yeah. Another one I'll just touch on is uh, there's this, the, 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 uh, the narrative about exponential growth. It kind of is built into this mm -hmm. neoliberal philosophy. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, but exponential growth is is an illusion because every system ultimately hits limits and then you and then you end up in a dynamic set of feedback processes and everything else but mm -hmm. but it's it's such a pretty model to think about exponential growth and now that's that's also infested the whole tech industry because it's you know because of the fact that Moore's law worked for whatever it is four mm. or five decades in terms of driving down you know the price and 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 increasing the capacity of these computer uh computer chips and memory you know there's this theory that there's this sense that oh well it's always going to continue technology is always going to solve our problems but that's that's a blind faith in exponential uh functions which simply does not exist in the real world and it's 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 the same thing with the uh, failure to understand the laws of thermodynamics, that yes, okay, the Earth might be an open system in terms of sunlight coming in, et cetera, et cetera. However, we're dumping the waste in a, in a, in a biosphere of a fixed uh, volume, and we are therefore dumping what we call growth is actually when you do the overall sums, it's destroying the, destroying the ecosphere. And there's only so much destruction it can cope with in self-repair, and we've gone well beyond that. And the people who are most ignorant about that who are ones most responsible for it are economists. I I want to I want to bring uh, I want to bring Mike back into this equation and ask him answer this equation. <laughs> I, 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 I want to bring him back into this equation and ask him about exponential growth, Moore's law, and the fallacy there. But before I get an answer from him, I'm gonna re I'm gonna rewind the tape a little bit. I'm so excited that you guys brought up Galois and the seventh order solving of or non-solving of uh, seventh order polynomials. Um, this is a an image for those of you that don't know, there was a duel that ended this man's life and Galois lost. He died. The night before this duel, he actually scribbled this down on a piece of paper. And this is an I mean, you can't this is available on Wikipedia. Have a look at it. But this is one of the greatest um, minds uh, of all time. This is, this, is, this is a truly amazing story uh, of, of, of academic genius. So that little, that little shot out, because we gloss over it, and I just, I just love, I love that, that story of, of uh, Galois. Um, and now, I want to go back to that question that I brought up with Mike on exponential growth. What are your thoughts about the fallacy of continued exponential growth using, say, the model of uh, Moore's law? Uh, what are your thoughts there, Mike? Well, exponential growth is uh, woven into the fabric of uh, economic education, right, from, from day one. If you look at, you know, Herod Domar's um, Herod and Domar's models and 
Solo Swan and Caldor Passanetti, all the way up to the present day, you know, uh, Romer models and the economics of ideas, they all have exponential growth that continues on forever. The, the most modern growth theory that dominates the profession now, Rome, as started by Romer, is that, well, you know, yes, there are physical limits. We acknowledge that. Uh, and they'll use the example of a piano, and it has, what, 88 keys, and that's a finite number. The number of keys doesn't change, but the combinations are infinite. So you can produce any number of songs, all uh, unique, from this finite number of, of keys. In other words, it's not so much that resources are finite, but rather ideas uh, of, uh, are the, the driving force, which uh, figures out new ways to use things. Something wasn't a resource yesterday, but somebody comes up with a use for it. Now, now it's a resource. And so you have increasing returns to scale instead of Ricardo's diminishing returns, right? And you get exponential growth. So, um, you know, how do you how do you combat that? It's it's taught everywhere. You're taught to think that way. You look at graphs of GDP. There is a cycle in there, but the trend is 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 obvious. Uh, so I don't I don't know what the answer to that is. You know, we can we certainly build models that have uh, other uh, assumptions in them. Um, when I was studying system dynamics, one of the uh, 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 sayings associated with the world models was that uh, when you're traveling down the highway at 100 miles an hour, uh, approaching a hairpin turn, uh, no matter how hard you stand on the brakes, at some point you're going over the cliff, that the momentum of the system can uh, uh, supersede some of these innovations and what have you. They would run simulations that say, let's assume that there's a problem with this resource or with pollution. Let's assume that people solve the problem. And they put that in the model and you still have problems. You still have exponential growth giving way to some other uh, time shape. So, um, yeah, so and, and exponential, by the way, exponential growth has two features that are quite important to uh, understand. And nobody understands them because if even very intelligent, highly educated people, you say, draw me a graph as to whatever is growing. They draw a straight line up or a straight line down if it's shrinking. They don't generate uh, an exponential time shape. And in fact, if you look on a, uh, any exponential on any given time scale, lots of it looks linear. You could fit a linear regression to it and it would look pretty good for a chunk of it. So they say it's easy. But exponential growth has two features that are very important. Number one, it's insidious. It sneaks up on you. One cancer cell divides or, or, or multiplies to two, then to four, then to eight. No big deal. But at some point, boom, it's out of control. That's why they say American Cancer Society says, catch it early and we might be able to save you, right? So it's, it's insidious. It sneaks up on you. And then secondly, it's powerful. It's crazy powerful. So nu nuclear reactions are exponential growth, right? So, um, you know, if it's something bad that's growing exponentially, it's sneaking up on you and you better get it soon because otherwise it's going to be out of control. George, um, we're at we're at, we're getting close to the top of the hour. Um, let uh, I want you to kind of add in on on that with some final thoughts before we transition into the after show. Um, give it to me, George. Um, I think Mike hit on some of the ifs, ands, and buts of uh, exponential growth within a very specific domain uh, that is a limited range of uh, possible values in a given system. Um, yeah. It's exponential, and uh, and it's very valuable to be able to know that and see that, and for both reasons, you know, one is uh, it has a good good property. You know, you invest, and there's exponential compounding that's valuable. You want to teach your kids that principle, um, but also the fact that you know exponential means something that's you know it's like the sorcerer's apprentice. It can start out as something you know a little issue, whatever, but exponential growth means that it can become very big but that is only within a limited domain and uh, i think that's what people that's what people forget and i think the the you know the one example or analogy you started with computer cells i like the idea of uh, bacteria in a petri dish you know you start with one and yeah they're going to follow an exponential growth curve for a period of time and then and then they'll reach a point where the food is gone and there'll be a, a, a catastrophic collapse and, you know, that's what the concern is about using exponential modeling, you know, 
outside of limited domains where, you know, and then it becomes part of, it's part of the new, neoliberal philosophy. You know, oh, we don't have a problem. We'll take care of it. The, the, the uh, pro, uh, techno optimism that says, oh, you know, climate, climate change, we'll, we'll deal with that problem. We'll figure out the solutions, all that stuff. Those are very, very dangerous frames of mind when you're dealing with things that, you know, that could lead to significant collapse. So um, I just wanted to get to that. And the, the other thing that shows up, I think, if we, if we look at the way people think about economic theory, you know, quite often uh, behind it, and I think behind the neoliberal uh, uh, philosophy, there's clearly motivated reasoning. And we tell ourselves stories, we tend to believe those stories, and when we are motivated, in this case by, you know, I like being selfish and I like all my money or whatever it is, I, you know, I like that. Um, it's easy to tell yourself the story about neoliberalism, uh, you know, as a philosophy and, and believe in the value of free markets and let's not have regulation, let's just have free markets solve all those problems. And I can be selfish and self-righteous at the same time. So um, these are the stories that we're telling ourselves. And, you know, we, we need Steve and Mike and other people to start telling the real story about, uh, you know, how we need to behave in these sophisticated systems in order to have it turn out, you know, turn out for the good rather than for only a few. I, uh, that's great. I really love that, uh, George. Um, I want to actually throw the, the final word to Professor Steve Keen. Um, you will have known uh, Adam Smith, obviously. Uh, the uh, butcher, well, the brewer, well, not, not, personally, not, in the, not personally, not, not in the biblical or personal <laughs> sense. But not <laughs> sense. Uh, so the three B's, the butcher, the brewer, and the baker, right? Um, and this is leads to this idea of motivated self-interest. They're not doing it for society. They're not doing it for the community. And there's part of me that that resonates. It, it's, you know, why are we doing this? And there's uh, yeah. a, well, just wait, yeah. there's I a mean, description of self-interest. Okay. So that's one thing. Yeah. And before I pass the baton over to you, I want so I want you to talk about the three B's of Adam Smith. And then I also want you to, I remember something you told me a little while ago about even uh, Professor Steve Keen has, is surprised with exponential growth. So when you model something, you're like, what? I mean, it just sneaks up on you and you work with exponentials yeah. all the time. So we're going to talk about those two things. And I want to set up the show because we only have basically, Steve, you're going to get the last word to summarize the show. And we're going to go into another phase of the show. And, and how I'd like to start that that that, that um, portion of the show is we've mentioned a word and a concept, neoliberalism. Okay, I'd like to really delve into neoliberalism in the second half of the show. To me, it seems like a catch all for everything that's bad on both sides of the equation. And I hope to bring that up in an open conversation post show. So guys, stick around. Now, back to Steve on Adam yeah. Smith and also uh, how it's difficult to get ahead of exponentials. Steve? Well, I mean, with Adam Smith, I mean, the, the, is what, I think the actual phrase in the Wealth of Nations is that uh, manufacturers rarely get together except in a conspiracy against the public. So he's uh, quite capable of saying that, uh, you know, manufacturers, even though they're supposed to be competing with each other, will collude uh, to their own benefit. And so he's always seeing the potential for self-interest overtaking what he wanted to see, which was people recognising the, the, mor the, the moral philosophy that he was into, where you have to take and care take care of each other and subsume your personal interests to the collective good so there's there's elements of socialism in adam smith that people who think uh, they're being followers of smith today who have no bloody clue about quite quite intriguing at the same time i blame smith for destroying the notions of the physiocrats which could have led us to a, a fit by a physically realistic economics and instead we ended up with the nonsense that we have today where they don't even include uh the physical uh, real world in the in the production models that they that they create but like when my first discovery of like i, I was reading about chaos theory because it was a, of course i was fascinated by that area being a critic of mainstream economics but i first developed uh the, the model with, which showed that uh, ph phenomenon when i built my model of minsky's financial instability hypothesis and to do it i took goodwin's growth model which has two equations one for the employment rate the other for the wages share of gdp and then following the advice of John Blatt, one of the great mathematicians who 
dabbled in his later years in economics, he said to have made a finance sector. So I added a third element of private debt, which comes out of the finance sector. You capital for borrowing money to finance investment above the rate of profit or the level of profit. And um, when I've simulated that, I got a chaotic breakdown. I plotted it and this curve just goes like vertical in the debt ratio because what happened is GDP collapsed, so the debt ratio went to infinity. And um, that surprised me. I wasn't ready for it. And then understanding that is what gave me my overall uh, approach to economics. But I still have to say that I, I still tend to think linearly. I mean, I know like when I got my first month in Patreon, the, the income in the first month was $2,880. Wow. If I extrapolated that forward, it never got beyond the three times that level. It's come back down, you know. So you, you don't realise that what you actually face is not an exponential process. It's a logistic. But I've yeah. got a linear extrapolation all the way through. So we, we have uh, an inability to think in terms of dynamic processes which can become unstable. And yet the, the fact that dynamic processes become unstable is why we exist. All right, we're going to go into our second half of the show. I'd like to say that all of our, our participants are going to stick around into the second half, so that's great. Uh, thanks for everybody tuning in. Stay with us through the transition. We'll be here, um, and thank you. So here we go. And, uh, we did it again. Now, as I said, our last show was canceled after you appeared on it, so... Fingers crossed the executives don't do that again. The more I read in the neoclassical thing, the more I, I just, you know, my scratching my eyeballs out all the time. I'm okay. the voice of God in the background. Oh, geez. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> the Once the coins get uh, warm enough because of your body temperature in the winter, it actually keeps you <laughs> moderate beer drinking in the evenings. Well, that's inspiring yeah. for a Saturday morning. We're still friends, and we're just going to kind of come, come off the rails here. Um, I want everybody to kind of comment, do you like the suit? And I want you to do it underneath the video. Um, last week, I forgot to ask everybody, hey, comment on the video itself, not just in the chat. It's good for the algorithm. We're all to promote this show to the masses, so please do that. Hit the like button. Subscribe. If you're on Twitter, hit the like button. Retweet. And then come over chat join the conversation a lot of fun uh we're gonna kind of branch off and talk about a lot of things i think i want to bring dan in first because he was kind of framing uh what he wanted to talk about in the second half and i want to get to that first and then after that i want to kind of talk to mike about a few things that i might potentially work on with him that he's trying to get going and we'll get steve's opinion we'll get george's opinion um daniel what what was the framing? You you had some framing, neoliberal framing there. Sounded interesting. Uh, kind of frame it up, and we'll get some opinions from the participants. Yeah, I mean, neoliberalism is is something that we hear a lot of, and I think that nobody wants to be a neoliberal, right? It's something you would agree to, right? And um, as a philosopher, I uh, and I think all philosophers. <laughs> I mean, people in general that have uh, inquisitive minds are just attracted to irony and contradiction and uh, the novelty that an in individual can bring is to look at some of these things and, and, and just notice uh, some ironies and contradictions and, and say, okay, well, what, what's, what's kind of odd or off or, or, or different about this? And I'm noticing that on, on the right and on the left, neoliberalism, neoliberal uh, neoliberalism is kind of thrown under the bus in on you know from both sides of the aisle and it's defined differently from both sides of the aisle right so um the, the, it, 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 it's a mess daniel and like for first of all there are people who are very happy to be neoliberal mm. uh and they, they really thought neoliberalism was was going to be a, a saving philosophy of humanity saving us that terrible keynesian period we went through 
And uh, if you if you look at uh, what the neoliberals argue, and I think I can claim some authority in knowing what they argue, because actually, in my opinion, it originated in Australia under the Labor government of Hawke and Keating. And I was fighting against it at the time, saying it's going to blow up on your faces. Okay. Uh, but the idealism was to combine mainstream economic theory uh, with sort of a sort of a, Mainstream economic theory of being progressive on social issues. That's what I describe it as. So if you go back to the the the, um, the the big moment for Australia was after 23 years of conservative rule in 1972, at the end of the year, the Australian government threw out the so-called Liberal Party, which is better described as the Conservative Party in Australia. They, did, they used the word liberal as a historical element, but fundamentally they're politically and economically conservative. Uh, they got thrown out, the Labor Party came in under a leader called Gough Whitlam, who's extremely charismatic, a very good lawyer and a brilliant writer and orator, but he knew nothing about economics and he, he basically accepted the textbook approach. Uh, and, and he was persuaded in 1973 to cut Australian tariffs by 25% across the board as an inflation fighting mechanism. Now, the whole lot of us have flew out of that. The Labor Party got thrown out and three years later uh, in a semi-coup, but also a, a, a political, uh, they lost lost in a landslide to the Liberals once more. And Well, pa that, pause, pause for a minute, Steve. Isn't that, yeah. isn't that like, a, um, like a free market, uh, like you're trying to deregulate? De uh, yeah, but, but, it's, but it's tied up with political progressive philosophy. This is mm. the point. So you had the when, when Labor got back in power after the Conservatives, the point I wanted to, to finish on, uh, the Labor Party had been in the wilderness for another seven years. And they said, we have to come, if we're going to be successful, we have to combine our socially progressive policies with economically sensible policies. They said, we're going to push women's rights and Aboriginal recognition and social welfare and education and health, blah, 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 in the context of running a free market economy. And that became the philosophy of Hawke and Keating, which was then adopted, you know, deregulation and so on. That was adopted by the Labor Party in England under Tony Blair. And we had the same thing picked up by Bill Clinton in America. So neoliberalism mm -hmm. as a political philosophy began in Australia. And my point against it at the time was, look, OK, I mean, I'm in favour of all those social ideals you have. But you're accepting that an economic textbook describes reality. Now, if you implement those policies in practice, they're going to blow up on your face at some point. And they, the, this failure of the economic policies will undermine your social policies as well. So people will become anti-women's rights and anti-gay rights and anti-black, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it's what's actually happened. Mm -hmm. Guys, uh, George, what are your thoughts? Mike? You know, the, the history of the United States may be a little bit different because uh, I think it can kind of go back to Ronald Reagan in our case to mm. the time when, you know, the elevation of free markets mm. to to um, uh, preeminent status, uh, the uh, the negative opinion about regulation and government um, discussion about small government. You know, let's let's let the uh, you know take off the regulatory regime, and you know, and then free markets will do their good thing, and we'll 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 grow faster, and we'll be better, and it'll all be better. Um, and uh, but it is something that is strongly uh, prevalent in both the Democrats and the Republicans, and and yet there has also been a strong backlash from um, you know for the from those who see the uh, oppressions that can result uh, from, uh, you know, very, very large corporate institutions that are probably uh, quite guilty of regulatory capture and, uh, and political capture. You know, the, the, the voice of the vote seems to go where the money is and the money is with the, the, uh, the capitalists who, who have very strong, powerful, uh, reasons to believe in neoliberalism because it really works for them. And, you know, don't, don't let the regulators get in my way. It's just, you know, it's just a negative. So in some sense, the conservatives and, and uh, you know, and, and the uh, corporate conservative in the sense of socially conservative, which is not traditionally, I, I don't think pro corporate, but, uh, it's now allied with it in a strange way. And, 
And for the corporate side, you know, there's, there's just really strong motivated reasoning to believe in neoliberalism because it works so well for them. And, and that's, uh, you know, it's, it, it, so you, you see that in the fact that a lot of very, very wealthy tech moguls are, are you know, funding, funding the uh, Republicans. Yeah, well, my point about neoliberalism is actually a thing of the left. Okay. Neoliberalism is the left believing they should be market oriented. Okay. And then and attenuating in various ways. So I saw somebody in the say, what about Reagan and Thatcher? Yeah, that's true. Reagan and Thatcher predate uh, uh, the Labour Party in Australia turning to the textbook economics plus social policies. But it's that's the actual act that I see bringing of neoliberalism. We had conservatism, Milton Friedman style stuff on one point market uh, straight market thinking and that can be still characterized as quite right wing uh what you have is neoliberalism says you can be left wing but you're pro pro market at the same time mm. and that combination is what brought the brought us unstuck so uh, if, if it had just been if you imagine it just been maggie thatcher and ronald reagan pushing all the market stuff and the labor party pushing back against it then when the whole thing collapsed we'd be blaming their political views for the situation we're in and say with neoliberalism, we're blaming the left for the situation we're in. And that, I think, is the real failing of neoliberalism. Very insightful. Mike, what are your thoughts? Please weigh in. Well, I think, uh, at least in the United States, um, there is this long-standing philosophy since the founding of the country that uh, we don't want a powerful central government sticking mm. its nose in our daily lives. Mm. You know, the, the idea was when they were writing the U S constitution, we just threw a strong central government out of here. <laughs> King George et al. We're not going to install, you know, replace it with another tyrannical, potentially tyrannical uh, government that they, they weren't anarchists. They realized there, there was a role for the state, but the, the entity, the main entity of government was to be the state, the former colony, the States, not the federal government, not the central government. So that idea persists, I think, to the present day in a lot of, a lot of the country, and of course, economically speaking, now we're talking about free markets and what have you. And for that matter, you know, the austerity, all the neoliberalism stuff. The um, the traditional answer in economics is that you should use free markets except when there's market failures, when there's spillover costs like pollution, and then we the, the uh, unregulated free decisions of people cause an overproduction of the bad thing or spillover benefits like having an educated populace, we underproduce it. Or when you have, as Steve pointed out, Adam Smith pointed out correctly, that uh, you can have uh, monopolies and cartels and all this sort of um, nonsense going on where free markets really aren't free. Well, then there's a role, there's a role for the state, right? And so then you get into, well, when is that exactly happening? You know, when is the spillover really significant and, uh, and what have you? Lastly, I'll say this. I'm reminded of uh, when I used to teach at the University of Notre Dame, uh, we, in, in the business school, there was a giant faculty lounge with two huge cauldrons of coffee that were going all the time. And so everybody would go in there to have a cookie and a coffee and whatever. And there was this group of economists who would sit off to the side by a blackboard and they were working their way through Lucas and Stokely which at the time anyway was the Bible of rational expectations, macroeconomics. And one day I said, I went over by him and I said, why are you guys doing this? Because they're, they're, they're going page by page trying to learn this very complicated mathematics and stuff. I said, you can't possibly tell me that you think people actually believe this way or actually uh, make their decisions this way. And they said, no, of course not. But we want to get macroeconomic papers published in, and they'll no journal, no good macro journal will accept an article unless it has the rational expectations assumption in it. In other words, they didn't care about the economy. <laughs> they cared about publishing articles and journals. So, you know, when, <laughs> so when you got to, the economists know, at least academic economists know how to get their, their bread buttered, right? They were taught by their teachers, what journals to publish and how to get published how to do that and if you got to follow a particular narrative because they're the people running those journals that's what they believe or that's what they were taught sort of path dependent right 
<laughs> you go down that path and then generation after generation is is taught that stuff well what do you do you're like well i want to get tenure i want to get promoted i want to get a raise you know you 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 do that and yeah yeah there's the economy out there i don't really care <laughs> yeah i um i wanted to bring this up for steve so steve i first um heard this sound bite from you when you had your your podcast with phil dobby and it kind of goes like this and I'll, I'll i'll frame it and then i'll let you articulate it but in 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 energy collapse or um rapid degrowth we're going to see the need for swift government intervention uh there's times where the capitalist market just is not quick enough to respond to to large-scale infrastructure or uh economies falling over what what can you, does, am i describing that like you're actually making a cause for you're, you are pro-capitalist right and we know we know that yeah. but we're it's being eroded it's being uh systemically dismantled please comment on 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 the fact that we're gonna be in a in a state of necessity for 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 government intervention yeah, well, I mean, fundamentally, I'm I'm a both a critic and a fan of capitalism. Okay, I think that uh, it, it generates an enormous amount of uh, creativity and ideas and so on, as people have emphasised. It wouldn't have happened without the fossil fuel revolution that changed, uh, that gave us that potential for a, for a while, unlimited growth. Uh, so, but but it's but it is a creative force. If you look at the ideas that people develop in capitalism, far more innovative than we saw under feudalism. Uh, socialism and so on. So that's a positive for capitalism. But by ignoring the limits, and the neoclassical economists have set us up for a point where we're going to cause a catastrophic collapse in our capacity to produce. And in that situation, if you left the distribution of income that capitalism has generated, which itself has been made worse by economic theory, uh, if you let that distribution be the determinant of who ate and who lived, 90% uh, of the population will starve. And they don't take count to that. So what you end up with is a social overthrow. And you got a breakdown of the system. And then in that, you have two choices, either Mad Max or an authoritarian government. And I'm afraid it, I prefer an authoritarian government. I don't like it, but I prefer it to Mad Bloody Max. So my perspective is what we're going to see in the aftermath of the collapse that is coming our way, ecological collapse. I don't think we're, gonna, we're not going to avoid it. We're going to cause it. Uh, in that aftermath, the only way you're going to have a potential to hold together a relatively sophisticated society a uh, complex society is with an authoritarian government and therefore i rule out any potential for survival of most countries in europe the united states of america as well most of south of latin america a certain amount of chance i think of some countries in, in asia will survive because they have an integration of the military into their current political and economic systems uh, but i but i fundamentally think you know when, when you have a breakdown like we're going through now uh, it isn't the private sector that solves the problem you get government command driven system the market the the the, the, the pri private firms will produce the commodities necessary for whatever objectives the government puts forward like sherman tanks in the second world war maybe uh in this case it'll be mirrors dramatic production of mirrors to reflect sunlight back into outer space once we start realizing what we've done to the planet by destroying arctic summer sea ice uh but yeah in that situation it'll be a government driven system and i'm saying that not because i want a government driven system but because i think it's inevitable given the collapse of the productive system that is we can blame both economists and self-interested uh business people and the fight in the fossil fuel industry for pushing us into this crisis and we'll be on the other side it won't be a capitalist system and so the death of capitalism will be caused by neoclassical economists Great stuff. Um, thank you everybody for joining in on the chat. Remember to like and subscribe to at Professor Steve Keen, his YouTube channel. And if you're watching on Twitter, retweet and like, and then come over here and hit us up on the chat. Make sure you comment underneath the video. That helps us out a lot with the algorithm. I kind of want to steer this into another direction. Mike um, is trying to launch a project called Trending Cycles. And I've kind of jumped on board. This is something, you know, that I'm really passionate about is joining economics uh, with system dynamics because the current state of economics um, is a disaster. It's, it's embarrassing. You can look to Larry Summers 
on Jon Stewart the other day and kind of see that right in front of your face. Um, so I want to bring in Mike for him to kind of lay out his idea with trending cycles. I want to get George's opinion specifically because he's kind of outside of the situation of, for one, uh, maybe economics as a whole, although he seems incredibly insightful. Um, I want his opinion on it because he might be able to give some feedback. And I also want the audience, um, as Mike lays it out, and we're tr trying to develop ideas how we promote it via social media, maybe a website, uh, course outlines. We'd really like the audience's opinion on how we could maybe structure it and get it out there to the masses where people are accepting it, taking it up. Um, but anyways, yeah, I'll uh, bring in Mike here. I'll unmute him. Mike? Lay it out for us. <laughs> Thank you, Ty. Uh, well, uh, uh, I'll try and be as concise as I can be. Um, uh, system dynamics was created by an electrical engineer. And uh, he, he decided that the biggest impediment to progress was not from physical systems, but from systems with people in them. So he combined what he knew, which was servo mechanisms, feedback systems, digital computing and his experience as a manager on large scale engineering projects. And he created what we know today as system dynamics. And he, he created it to try and make corporations more successful. So basically he would model a company and then use the model to redesign the corporate system so it behaved better. And he spent the first decade and a half uh, building corporate models and the economists pretty much left him alone. Somebody asked him then, the former mayor of Boston, if you can model a company, can you model a city? And he said, yeah. So he did that and he built the first computer model of a city, published it in a book called Urban Dynamics. And that got the attention of some economists, kind of urban and regional economists. Then he was asked, well, if you can build a model of a company in a city, can you build a model of the world problematique, the predicament of mankind? The problems that are going to arise from the exponential growth of the world's population and they're demanding things. So the exponential uh, use of the world's resources and the exponential generation of pollution. So he said, yeah, I can do that. And he did that. And now he's playing in the macroeconomic sandbox and the economists went after him. And they said, basically, you're an electrical engineer. What do you know about it? And uh, so uh, the system dynamics people concluded economists hate system dynamics. Well, I came along in the 1980s as a graduate student and I discovered system dynamics by accident. And I said, wow, this sounds like the exact same thing that's being said in some schools of heterodox economic thinking. And so I, I wrote a paper as a student saying, you know, uh, these heterodox schools of thought should use system dynamics because they're saying all the same things, but they don't do any formal modeling. And that got some uh, attraction. Uh, I brought it to this electrical engineer's attention and he thought it was great. And uh, so I said, all right, let's try and develop this interface between economics and system dynamics in a manner that would be acceptable to both economists and system, dynamic, system dynamicists. And so we think we have figured out what that is now at least to a certain degree, and we want to uh, bring that to the public. Uh, the System Dynamics Society, the most frequent, the two fr most frequent questions they receive are, how do I learn how to do system dynamics at a high level? And I'm most interested in applying it to economics. So Trending Cycles tries to answer those two questions. We will teach you uh, how to do system dynamics from zero, you don't really know anything about it, to the PhD level if you want to go that far. And we'll show you how to combine it with economics in a manner that we believe will be acceptable to professional economists. Interesting. Now, I want to get an outsider's opinion. I know he's maybe not qualified in the area, but I think fresh ideas are always good to inject um into anything so george system dynamics engineering type field can it be applied to economics what do you think what do you think of trending cycles what are your questions about it um well i think it's a fantastic idea um and uh mike i'm going to follow up and and start following the i'm going to follow the trend of trending cycles um 
And it's similar to uh, what I'm more familiar with, which is the effort to put science behind all of the different features of complexity in the Santa Fe Institute. Um, so I don't know if you have any connections. I know they're, they're probably economists that have spent time there and, and uh, uh, tried to work on that. But I think it's a very, very important and very valuable effort. So I hope that's successful. Um, and this also, I'm going to digress a bit because this also, uh, I want to go back to what uh, Steve was saying about, you know, the, the hope for the future, which um, um, sounds a little pessimistic if we're looking towards collapse and, you know, it ain't going to work and we're going to collapse. And uh, I think there's, there's maybe an alternate way of thinking about this um, because, yes, the, uh, the system we are in from an economic standpoint, and I think also a cultural standpoint is, is unstable and unsustainable. And, you know, if we don't have some solution to it, it's gonna break. And if it breaks, if they break, it'll break. And well, they, it's already breaking in little, little pieces here and there. And you know, I think the war in Europe is, is an example. So things are breaking. We don't want them to break worse. Climate, the climate's breaking. We don't want it to break worse. Um, so, uh, you know, does that mean we have collapse or does that mean we have something else? And, and I'm, I'm thinking maybe something else and the something else, maybe we can think about it in terms of uh, biological systems, ecosystems. And uh, there are lots of things happening now, which I would characterize as, as green shoots, possible green shoots renewal. Um, and this show is an example of one of those green shoots. And, you know, Mike's trending cycles is an example of one of those green shoots. And my wife is uh, participating in, a, in an online course with, you know, hundred other people on emotional maturity. And I think that's a green shoot. Um, and there are people in the complexity field working on, um, you know, distributed autonomous organizations, uh, ways for people to gather together. And we actually have a technological infrastructure, infrastructure that will make that possible for people to get together. Yeah, there's a tendency for bubbles, but there's also a tendency for people to get together out of mutual concern and mutual interest and start building organizations at a very decentralized, discrete level to, to probe, to pursue, and to change. And some of these things in the coming decades hopefully become more, you know, they, they can go viral in this kind of environment. They can, they can become well-networked, you know, time, maybe you're going to be it, you know, just uh, taking these ideas out there. And then the dynamic becomes, you know, you're changing the culture from the bottom up through a de decentralized, democ democratized process of green shoots happening with lots of people talking. That becomes then uh, a large enough uh, kind of a set of movements that, that change the cultural ecology and the cultural ecology will change the political ecology. So it's, it's kind of hopeful that these kinds of discussions, we might feel like we're, you know, we're, we're batting against, you know, the, the giants and behemoths and, you know, there's no way to, to really combat, uh, you know, the in, in, entrenched embeddedness of, in these very large human institutions. But then again, you know, maybe there is. And uh, so if we keep doing these kinds of things in a positive way, you know, good rules of engagement, good conversations with people, honest, forthright, you know, we're in this together, that kind of dynamic at the interpersonal level can become a counterforce to the entrenched, embedded uh, power structures that exist. So anyway, that's a, that's a call for some, some hope in some dark times. Very nice. Steve, I want you to reply both to George, what he just said, and I want you to kind of speak on Mike's idea with trending cycles. What's your opinion? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm afraid my experience with the financial crisis makes me very skeptical about any chance for these alternative voices to get heard because like I was one of the handful of people who predicted uh, the financial crisis, not not, not the, the handful of economists, I better say, because lots of people were looking at it with, didn't hadn't been infected by neoclassical economic thought, were looking at what's happening in the housing market and were saying, well, there's got to be a crash coming out of it. People like Richard Vague, for example, who's uh, a, a, a very come a close friend over, over the years, but a, a banker who said, this just can't keep on going. That's why he sold his credit card companies uh, and got out before the crash. Uh, so that people without training economics were more likely to see the crisis coming than economists themselves. Now, the crisis occurred, and 
And quite frankly, because I'd warned about it, uh, I thought I would actually be, you know, potentially heard for my advice about it. Uh, no, I wasn't. I was ignored. And like in Australia in particular, I was sent up over the fact that how Australia avoided a housing price crash. And this, this, the fact that my warnings led to government policy, which reversed the crash, wasn't part of the discussion, just that I got that bet wrong. You know, it's all that people in Australia took out of it. And in America and so on, who are they turning to? Larry, pardon the French, fucking Summers now is still being listened to. Bernanke gets the bloody Nobel Prize last year. Okay, so the, the tendency for the what is the power structure to, to, to only stick within its own bubble to continue uh, uh, in the aftermath to a crisis it did not expect, had no warning of. And who do they turn to but people inside that same bubble? I think the same thing's going to happen this time round. Nordhaus, I will blame. I hope to be, I should say one of my ambitions in life is to be the expert witness in his prosecution for ecocide. Okay? That's my ambition. What do I expect to happen after the crisis hits? They're going to ask Nordhaus what to do. He won't have a bloody clue, but they'll take his advice. So I don't think we're going to, you know, I think the voices are important and the fact that the internet is there is better than the situation that applied uh, before, you know, back, say, the 80s crisis, for example, which I also was warning about a bubble crashing in 87, uh, again, on the basis of Minsky's theories. Uh, so the, 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 I, would, I would have no, 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 no profile at all out of the 87 warning. I got a profile out of the two seven, 2007 warning. I will get a profile out of what I'm saying on climate change too. But I don't expect the policy to be changed. We'll continue rambling on the last of the people who didn't see it coming for what to do about it. Okay. And it'll get worse and then we'll have a breakout coming out of that uh, as, as well. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm, it's not going to stop me trying, George, but I'm very, you know, very pessimistic about any chance of having an effect in changing our policy direction before it happens and even after. So, um, Steve, let's um, let's kind of steer this on trending cycles. What do you think about the union of uh, economics and system dynamics? Obviously, uh, there's Minsky, but you know, what's your opinion? Yeah, I well, think it's absolutely vital. And this is that Mike's point is is very very simple, and I can bring it back to a, a, a fundamental issue. In when you have a complex system, the structure of the system is more important than the actual individual entities in that system so if you have a linear system the, uh, the relationships of one part or the are additive and if something is 10 times the scale of something else it'll have 10 times the impact on the system no matter what with a non-linear system then, which is a trivial small part of it if it's got a multiplicative interaction will suddenly overwhelm the system so it's if you get the structure right the structure will tell you the behavior in general so i derive my minsky model now a model of Minsky's financial instability hypothesis, literally from economic definitions. If I take the definitions of the wage share of GDP, which gives you income distribution, the employment rate, which gives you the level of economic activity, and the debt ratio, private debt, which gives you the degree of financialization, put those three together with very simple behavioral terms, I get Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. So it shows that if you get the structure of a system right, even if you get the parameters wrong, to some large degree, the structure itself will tell you the behavior. So what post-Keynesians have been doing is fundamentally system dynamics in the dark. And what we're doing is say, let's do system dynamics in the light. So we bring out the uh, programs like Venn, Sim, Stella, and ultimately Minsky. But the, that, that is by far, the, the, Mike is absolutely right, and he was the first person to see it. If we get the system dynamics right, we generate non-orthodox economics. Thank you. Um for that, Steve. Um, I I want to actually switch it over to Mike now, and um, not not directly related, but Mike, are you are you would you describe yourself as post Keynesian, and um, how would you respond to um, what what Steve was saying? Uh, yeah, I guess I'm a post Keynesian institutional economist. If I were to sort of say what school of thinking I find myself in as an economist, um, what, what, what Jay Forrester, the, the, the person who created system dynamics, used to tell me when I was convinced, he's the engineer, right? And I was saying, you know, not all economists are going to hate system dynamics. Some will, but you've got to talk to the right economists who do economics 
like a system dynamicist. They just happen not to use system dynamics. He would say, why do you write papers for your fellow economists? They don't care about the economy. They care about publishing economics papers. And I said, well, that's, that's how I get tenure. That's how I get promoted and whatever. And he says, what you should do is what I do. And is right for the business community and right for the general public. And he said, they will love your stuff. And who cares what orthodox economists think or or what have you. And when I, he, now he was pretty old and I was pretty young when he was telling me that. But, you know, the more I think about it, the more I think that's the leverage point. That trending cycles, yes, we want what we do to be solid with the economics, at least with schools of thought in economics or professional economists, post-Keynesian or institutional or something will say, yeah, it's good. It's solid. That's fine. Check. But that people from the general public and the business community who are interested in economics can go there and hear some interesting and different things. I didn't mention before, I'll mention it now briefly, the, the sort of the sweet spot we think is system dynamics, behavioral economics, which is comes from psychology. You know, what do people really do when they make their decisions? Behavioral economists know a lot about that. We can put that, that stuff into our models now. And gaming. So you don't just want to write a white paper for the general public and they have to do, it's like a homework assignment. You give them a fun game to play, an engaging game of the some aspect of the economy and let them try and run the, the system, right? And they learn about all of these principles of shifting loop dominance and tipping points and limits to growth and, and what have you, rather than being, you know, forced to, you know, memorize a bunch of bunch of bullet points. So I think that, um, well, that's what we think is, you know, sort of the way to approach this. And um, we'll, we'll see if we're right or not, I guess. A, a game theory approach. That's, that's quite fascinating. Yeah. I like, I like that idea. Um, I, I really like that idea, Mike. Um, George, what, what are your thoughts um, on, on like a, on, on a cultural integration? How do you, how do you, how do you feel that we can integrate that to a wide audience? Yeah, I think that's a that's a good question, and I I, uh, I have a, a memory of a quote from Adam Smith that uh, you can correct me on if I'm wrong, but I think it was in his uh, his work on human nature, um, pointing out that that you know the real driving factor here in human nature is that you know uh, we all want to be loved and to be lovely, and so one of the one of the primary guardrails, I believe, on uh, on behaviors in of humans in the economic system was this uh, desire to be perceived well, and so you know that set up some cu cultural guidelines and behaviors. You know, you're supposed to be honest. You're supposed to be truthful. You want to be you know, trustworthy, all those things, the Boy Scout oath. Uh, uh, and um, I think as a, as a blowback to some of the um, negatives that we've been seeing in, in, in the economic system um, um, from neoliberalism and the way it, you know, what, what uh, trickles down to the lowest uh, 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 part of the economic spectrum is not a good thing. Um, uh, I think there's been disillusionment, and um, and I think I think we have a culture now where uh, you know it almost doesn't matter if you're perceived well. You know, you get more hits on on Facebook and TikTok if you're if you're nasty and you're loud. So it's kind of like a reversal at, at the cultural level. We we've, we've got a reversal of of this concept of virtue into something, you know, that the most important one is the ones who's loudest, most obnoxious gets the most, gets the most hits because, and then that gets monetized. So they get rich that way. Um, so uh, we've lost a cultural rooting for a, a basis upon which the trust was built that's foundational to the economic system. So um, in addition to finding a, better way to understand deal with the economic system we we need a way to, to kind of think about the cultural system that is underpinning that because we you know we have a loss of trust we have a polarization we have these these processes that are taking place in the culture that are uh 
contributing to and exacerbating the instabilities that we've that we've got. And uh, yeah, you can envision this turning into collapse, revolution, you know, uh, internecine conflict. We've seen that before in human history, you know, but, but, but maybe we can also uh, see it in um, some, some kind of evolutionary process um, and a way of addressing the, the disillusionment and despair which is leading to in our culture, you know, an epi epidemic of suicide and epidemic of polarization. So, uh, and that's what we can do in small groups like, like this one, like, you know, this conversation with you guys, we, we like each other. We like this interchange we're having. We've got an audience that's a part of it. This is a cultural change mechanism that, you know, if, if we get enough people talking about these things and, you know, and being parts of these groups, that's, that's sort of green shoots. And there was a great comment on the green shoots idea in the, in the I, I can't remember who it was who made the comment on the, in the chat, but uh, yeah, it sounds like, you know, little, little teeny weeny stuff happening in the midst of this chaotic, you know, crisis, the tsunami that's about to hit. But that's where we get to the fact that um, trends, cultural phenomenon, things can change and particularly early in the process in an exponential fashion. So we have, we have the potential for exponential development of these green shoots and these conversations and this cultural change process and these green shoots, in a, if, they, if they begin to carry forward in an exponential growth process, then it will not take that long for it to become a powerful driving political uh, uh, activity as well. So then we'll, potentially we have the opportunity of evolving the system in important ways rather than simply waiting for collapse or, or seeing collapse and then trying to pick up the pieces. So I like, I'm kind of positive, optimistic about that. And, I, um, and it's a way I think I see culture, culture and economics really, really tied together because, you know, uh, we do want people to want to be lovely and to behave that way. And, you know, right now, the way the systems are working, you know, they're not, they're not seeming to do that. Enough said. Well, everybody, I'm glad you're tuning in. This has been a great conversation today. We are just going in. Um, it's now an hour and 40 minutes of just nonstop intellectual depth. Um, make sure you hit the like button. Uh, subscribe. Um, if you're on Twitter, hit the like button, retweet. I know I'm repeating myself, but every little bit helps get this out to more and more people each week. Uh, personally, I'd like to thank Steve Keen for doing this over the last six months. For me personally, it's been a pleasure every week. Uh, all the guests that come in, George included now, you're now part of the Steve Keen and Friends family. Um, appreciate your time on a Saturday Mike, um, our new reoccurring contributor, um, I have think I think we've started a connection that's probably going to be similar similar to the one I have with uh, Steve, um, and that's important to me personally. And Dan, um, over the last year and a half, we have gone on so many endeavors. Um, I can't even keep track of them all. Some of them fail. Hell, most of them fail, but. There are ones that spike up, and this is one of them that has been a great pleasure. Um, all the chatters really appreciate it. I got to bring up the graphic. I got to run through the names. I'm going to get them wrong. Um, Ghost on the half shelf. Thank you. You've been here again today. Lana Dell, obviously glad to have you. Bree27, Botch Mandela, Conrad, Joe, Jennifer, TR. Thomas, I'm not even going to try to say your last name because I'm going to get it wrong and you're going to correct me on the chat. And I, I, I like making myself look bad, but it hurts when other people make me look bad. And that is the human nature inside of me. And finally, Tom S. Tom S. is becoming a pro Minsky user. Um, hopefully there's a point where we can maybe display one of his models on the... Uh, show in the future. Um, I'll go to Mike. Oh, no, I've turned Mike off. 
this is hard to run this when I'm talking at the same time. Uh, Mike, I, tr I tried to kind of bring up trending cycles, but we have so many. The conversation just kind of goes in every direction. Um, I have some new thoughts about what we could do. I want to include Steve Keen, even though he's busy, but I'm thinking, I'm thinking if we could get him on a one-hour recorded lecture, we could make a series of lectures using the Minsky software. I could finish up the lectures after and expand his model. Um, so what do you think? Can we convince Steve, even though he's a very, very busy man, to give a little bit of time for us? <laughs> I, I hope so. I, I love what uh, Steve does. Um, we kind of do the same thing. Uh, Minsky is a wonderful project and super kudos to, to uh, Steve knows better than any of us to produce a software package like that from scratch without a lot of resources. Yeah is horrifically difficult and the fact that he's made so much progress over time is just amazing to me so yeah that would be a wonderful addition to what we're trying to do at trending cycles we're software agnostic i mean people have yeah. to pick you gotta if you're gonna build a model you gotta pick some tool to use and different tools have different features that are useful for this or that but absolutely minsky would be uh, minsky models would be uh, more than welcome and steve's expertise would be more than welcome. And I can tell you, I was once on a panel with Hyman Minsky. He oh, was yeah. very old. I was very young. And I showed a system dynamics model. And after the panel, he pulled me aside and he goes, keep going, kid. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, he likes, I, I, uh, I take that to me. He likes system dynamics. Oh, yeah. Minsky and Forrester. This is, this is, pre that's, Mike, that's, that's really great, right? You've had that's some really privileged, cool. privileged mentors there, Matt. Definitely. Yeah, uh, like I'd, I'd like to. In fact, I'm giving a commercial set of lectures now, which people would be seeing maybe some fairly annoying Twitter ads from me at various times. That's been done by a marketing company, and and uh, they've been quite successful. They've got about 130 people have signed up to the lectures I give every Thursday. So that's a bit of a plug. It's helping my revenue out, and I'm quite enjoying putting the lectures together as well. And it's not a scam; it's genuine. But anyway, as part of that, I did a live building of. Uh, of Minsky's uh, financial instability hypothesis as the system dynamics model. So I simply said, let's start here. We start anywhere you like. I started from output to labor, to the employment rate, to the wage share, to the profit level, to the level of investment. Then I whacked in a financial sector and bang, I got my Minsky model. Just by showing exactly what we're talking about earlier, the structure of the economy gives you its dynamics. Um, so I'd happy to do that live uh, in one of the next shows. And Mike, I'd love to have you watch it as well, because as much as you say you're agnostic on software, so I am too, but I'm biased. I mean, I, I spent, I think, you know, I spent about 20 years in the software industry uh, as a software editor for a computing magazine. That's where I learned a lot of the concepts I put into Minsky. So, and I've, I've been financially constrained, about a half a million bucks is all that's been spent on building Minsky which is a ridiculously small amount of money to build something as sophisticated as Minsky is. And the reason that it's been done so well, I've got a brilliant program. I work with Russell Standish, who's a, just a, 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 one of my closest friends and a great, great pro programmer as well. So it's part of his talent that meant that half million has gone as far as it has. But the whole idea of Minsky is let people build a system and see what's the next likely point. And I think actually because the equations are visible on the on the canvas as you build the model it gives you i think more of a clue to some extent than the the standard sd model where it sits behind a text box and you've got to go inside the textbook to write the equation uh but I'd, yeah if you can do commentary while i build the model that'd be real fun and george your your uh, perspective there really want to shine in and join us on that that'd be intriguing too um yeah that sounds interesting i really like uh that uh effort Mike, and I hope that's successful. And yeah, um, I, I uh, it's funny, I wanted to credit Ty and Dan for for putting this thing together, Steve, with with you, you and your friends. Yeah. Uh, I think this is this is a wonderful example of, a, you know, of a green shoot enterprise to try and, you know, build conversation and build friendships and, and, uh, and expand ideas and uh, very, very exciting to see that. And, uh, you know, it's one of the reasons I'm, I'm yeah. you know, Daniel, I'm pleased to be one of your friends, because yeah. you 
draw people into different environments to have these conversations. And I think that's a very, in, in you know, in the long run, it's going to be a very powerful uh, way of helping to move and shape um, culture and um, and it's just great to be a great to be a part of it. it was a very exciting conversation. Okay, Kay, there's another Kay Kerber's comment on the card there. Yes, I like that idea. So if you can send a message to Daniel, uh, whatever that uh, roundtable is, I'd be happy to be part of it. Simon's a, a, a personal friend as well, as it happens. So that that's uh, quite intriguing. So uh, get in touch with Ty, and then we can link together. I'm going to, have to go, guys. I, I don't get serious migraines, but I do get migraines that affect my vision. That's happening right now. So I'm starting to cease seeing the screen. So I'll disappear now. Uh, great Steve. to have you all together. See you all Thanks. next week. See you, Steve. Okay. I guess the cop's saying not said yet. Message me and I'll notify you. Uh, uh, Killian. Okay. Uh, link, if you know my, my email, send me an email and we can work from there. By the way, this is how I first met Ty. Okay. A comment on the sideline. Ty was on the correlations, COVID and correlations thing and put a little <laughs> thing about... Uh, uh, Oh, okay. Thank you. I wasn't sure. Though, Kelly, fair enough. Sorry. Okay, I'm already part of that group. Yeah, but that, they, we met Ty that way, by the way. Side comment, and uh, look where it's led. Yeah, we even see the guy wearing a suit. Bye. All. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is Steve Keen for you. Another week of the man himself. It's always enjoyable. He's off to party it up somewhere in on the streets of. London, I guess he's in London, right? And he's always ga gallivanting around the world, um, you know, somewhere in Europe. He could be in Bangkok another week, Australia. I want him to come to Canada, Western Canada. Um, I can party it up with him. I know he likes to drink wine, so I'll have to put my Guinness beer off to the side and drink some fine Okanagan wine. We have an area in BC. BC is a province in Canada. And it has a very diverse climate. So we've got the, the rainy west coast. It's a rainforest. You know, we have Vancouver Island. Our interior has deserts to it. We also have the Rocky Mountains. So we literally have glaciers. Um, anyways, in the semi-arid area in BC, we have an area called o the Okanagan. Uh, Okanagan Lake, a bunch of towns around it. And it's our wine country. So maybe I can get him here. And we can get drunk on Okanagan wine. Daniel, what do you think about Okanagan wine? Oh, it's great. I mean, um, other than the fact that every summer it's plagued with um, forest fires and um, you know that type of thing, it's 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 beautiful. I mean, you don't have to be God believing to call it God's country. It's it's quite beautiful and very fortunate to live in one of the most beautiful places in the world it's uh it's 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 absolutely amazing has uh as uh, mike have you been to bc before uh yeah i did i've uh, been to vancouver a couple times uh lovely city um as i remember um the uh you could go in a half hour you could go skiing in the mountains but the city has no snow removal equipment because it's unnecessary <laughs> So, yeah, so yeah, yeah. I remember we, we, watching the, the seaplanes yeah, come in and land. Uh, we we neat. we had two or maybe two centimeters of snow about a month and a half ago, and it was right during rush hour. So Vancouver has its outlying cities. I'm down in Richmond by the airport, um, and we were shut down for 24 hours. <laughs> two, two centimeters of snow. We we can't handle it here down on the coast. Now we get in the interior in the mountains they know how to deal with snow but here in the city no we we know how to deal with rain we have umbrellas uh but when it comes to the drivers here driving in the snow my god it is incredibly frightening uh G george sorry dan george have you been to bc uh uh, well, I have been to Jasper National Park. I had a great uh, vacation there one summer just a few years ago. And uh, we're actually, my wife and I are coming back up this summer to do some hiking up there. It's just beautiful. And um, we liking, like hiking in Colorado is where we are now. And also the Catskills where our summer home is. And uh, But uh, the nice thing compared to the Colorado Rockies is, you know, 
the Jasper is, is a little lower in elevation, so it's not quite that so demanding. So I've been through Vancouver, you know, looks nice, but haven't actually uh, stayed there, but thinking sometime of getting over there and visiting Daniel. Mm -hmm. Now, and maybe you too, Kai. Yes, you know. I'd love to meet you. Uh, and I might, I might add that that's where my wife and I, Marie, we go, that's like our vacation spot, like our staycation is Banff and ja Jasper, and yeah. Coho, yeah. if you you're ever back in Jasper, come across the BC border uh, right mm -hmm. uh, by Lake Louise and go into Coho National Park. And it's got one of uh, the second highest waterfall in North America, I believe. Um, yes. And I we, we took a side tour down, you know, we drove down that way. I don't know if we were all the way there, but I remember a... Uh, a fantastic waterfall and then also a trail that leads to the Burgess Shale. Oh, yeah. Yes. Which is, uh, you know, fantastic geological, ancient, ancient geological uh, formation that contains some really, really interesting stuff. Um, not that I'm a geologist or paleontologist or anything, but, um, but it kind of fascinates me. Beautiful country, too. It's great. Daniel, what were you going to say, buddy? Well, I don't know. Okay, I want I want Ty to possibly shoot me down here, but I'm going to try and attempt to wrap the show up with a mic hand over to Mike. Okay. 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 Now we're discussing this live, and if yeah, if if, if you I don't like the idea. Remember just what shoot happened. Me down. Remember what happened to your weekly scheduling po position? Uh, scheduling <laughs> that too. Yeah, after the George <laughs> fiasco, sending him the wrong year or month uh that was <laughs> that was it for daniel in the scheduling department but you know what i'm open to ideas so <laughs> let's hear it okay so mike um i heard you discuss a problem with your roof and yep. you said it just like that so uh <clears throat> in canada we call rough roofs and you called a rough roof even though you're in america so how do you break down that dialect and your affinity towards a Canadian uh, pronunciation. That's how I'd like you to wrap up the show, man. And you've got two minutes and 30 seconds to give us kind of like a rough sketch. <laughs> I didn't know I did that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just thought you were wondering why I was wearing a hoodie uh, <laughs> to the show because of uh, the uh, home construction work I will be doing shortly here. Um, well, uh, I guess in New England, we deal with snow. In Colorado, I'm sure George deals with snow. And I know up in Canada, you guys do, although on the coast, it sounds like it's more of a rain thing. Um, what happened at my house, just let me put it this way. What happened at my house when I discovered water coming through my kitchen ceiling? I had like, okay, what happened? It turns out the people who installed the roof never uh, caulked around a vent pipe. And when I finally opened the ceiling and looked up in there. I'm like, okay, that's, there it is. And so uh, I'll be sliding around on a metal roof here in a little while with a cop gun. And under the assumption I don't fall off, I'll be with you guys next week. <laughs> yeah, we certainly hope you don't fall off the roof. I, I yeah, maybe, maybe you could um, temper your, um, your expectations by doing a quick little Google search and, and find out how many, I think it's a prevalent uh, issue with phones. So just be careful, my friend, to just be really careful. My, that's my plan. <laughs> get up, caught, get down. <laughs> my so house what, is a ranch. So it, even if I fall, it's not very Oh, I see. I see. Okay, I see. I see. Okay. Well, if it was George, super high, I'd get somebody to do it for me. Yeah. 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 George, final words. Any any uh, rough repairs coming up? Just let's all be nice. Yeah. Let's be friends. Let's get along, and uh, you know, and we can do better. It was a good show. Thanks. Well, that is another episode of Stephen Friends and the After Show, where we remain friends, as George kind of just pointed out. There, we will see you next week with a new guest, and that's it. See you later. <laughs>